Well, George Glaheli is a journalist and political commentator with Young Voices and uh, is here to talk us through the top stories. George, really good to see you. Thank you very much for, for being with us this morning. I, I mean, we better start with Christmas. Uh, it's only a few months away and according to some of the papers, well, none of us are going to get any presents. Yeah, I think this is obviously a global issue. It's mainly to do with our post-pandemic sort of rise in, um, in transport and shipping. However, obviously that's not how most people are thinking about it rationally. They're thinking, and I've, am I going to be able to, you know, have food on my table for Christmas and beyond? Um, I think, of course, not to dramatise things. I mean, we live in a developed country. We're very lucky. We have access to, you know, more food ever than in history. Um, however, I think it's going to reflect very poorly on the government's ability to deal with this crisis if we do, for example, end up with, let's say, turkey shortages. I mean, was it last week we heard that apparently Boris Johnson, even though he's denied this, was whispering, you know, in the ear of Bolsonaro, obviously the president of Brazil, begging him to um, import turkeys to the UK. So while it is sort of all relative, you know, it doesn't look good. <laughs> For anyone involved. There's a global <laughs> crisis and there is a global problem, but it does seem to hit the UK more than others. And this is because of the HGV drivers. The, the, we've got the boss of Maersk saying we're not going to send containers to the UK anymore because, frankly, yeah. they just, they're just piling up in the ports. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, yeah, of course, we saw that story this morning, um, a massive backlog at the port in Felixstowe, and you just mentioned the HGV issue. And I think that, as I was saying, it is a global issue, but it does seem that the supply chains in place in a lot of places in you know, the rest of Northwestern Europe and other places in the world, while they're, they're experiencing the same issues, their supply chains are clearly more resilient. I think it speaks to, I guess, how we maybe a very short term in our governance of these kind of things um and we didn't necessarily i say we i mean the government <laughs> um, because actually the industry have been you know of course telling the government that this is going to happen for months and months and they chose to ignore it um so it's interesting to think about why that decision was made <laughs> mm. Yeah, the gas crisis isn't going away either, is it? Four more energy suppliers could collapse, we're hearing this week. Uh, that's four more. I mean, we've had quite a few already in the last uh, six weeks or so amid uh, soaring wholesale energy prices, leaving thousands of home, homes facing, of course, higher bills. Um, Georgia, this, this crisis, so-called crisis, doesn't look like it's, it's going to be over anytime soon either, does it? No, absolutely not. And, um, of course, we saw the energy cap we rose um, sort of the start of this month and it will be reviewed again in February. Uh, and then when it's reviewed in February, um, if it goes up, which realistically it will, because we don't, you know, see any kind of miraculous situation to this, uh, miraculous solution to this situation rather in the next few months. Um, because once again, it's a global issue. People are dashing to buy liquefied natural gas, um, especially um, across Europe, because there's been basically not enough storage of energy over the summer because we've had poor, um, you know, wind power ability, quite um, an unwindy summer, so to say. Um, and of course, sort of industry getting back on its feet in Asia. So everyone's dashing for that. And the UK, you know, we're not the first, uh, the first country that people are going to want it salad to. And um, I think that it's going to be possibly very devastating when these, um, Providers collapse and people are, first of all, you know, out of work. Um, but of course, we have seen a rise in vacancies. So that's I mean, one that the one good thing um, that we've seen in recent days, probably the only good story, unfortunately. Um, however, realistically, these prices will come back on consumers, whether it's from inflation, whether it's through, uh, through higher energy prices now and going into the spring next year. Um, and unfortunately, there are millions of households across the UK that won't be able to cope with that, especially given everything they've gone through with the pandemic and the lockdowns. So it really does worry me when I think about the impact on the cost of living for um, most normal people. Um, I think if you look at the stats, there's a massive, uh, you know, chunk of the population who, you know, they don't have savings, their employment isn't necessarily stable. Um, and I think that eventually, you know, we could see some really devastating impacts more than we are doing now. Um, and it doesn't really seem like there's any sort of long-term planning for this. Um, the tax rises are going into social care. Um, 
when we see the budget at the end of this month, you know, I don't know what we're going to see. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the government seem to, I don't think they, they seem to have that as that first priority. Now, uh, help me with this story. It's on the front pages of most of the papers. The EU is to offer an olive branch on, on Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, and yet, you've got Lord Frost saying they need to change their view. You've, you've got the government saying that we, uh, Brussels is t talking tough. This is a deal signed by Lord Frost, negotiated by Lord Frost, negotiated and signed by this government. And, and yet, the, they're saying this is all down to the EU. Mm -hmm. I do think it's very odd. I know that when the deal was originally signed, um, the government, I believe, expressed sort of reservations, but that's not really good enough, is it? They did sign it. Um, I think they sort of, in a few words, to summarise it, maybe they said, oh, it's not that big of a deal, or we'll be able to change it, blah, blah, blah. And of course, they are going to be renegotiating parts of it. However, I think um, we are really approaching an impasse because obviously the Guardian led with the headline Olive Branch, but we knew that they were going to be offering those kind of things, uh, you know, last week in terms of allowing British chill goods in. Uh, we obviously um, are hoping for an end to the so-called sausage wars. Um, however, the British government thinks that removing the European Court of Justice from oversight um, of the protocol is, is what's needed. And that is not going to happen if you've listened to you know, any of the EU representatives, uh, members of the Irish government um, give their interviews this week. That's simply not going to happen. So um, at this point, I think we really are heading for Article 13, uh, sorry, <laughs> Article 16 rather, um, being triggered sometime in November. Um, and I worry for what the implications could be for that in Northern Ireland, especially those are the people that have to live with the consequences. And obviously this very sort of fragile social fabric political fabric there with their history um and you know i don't think i don't think the uk and the eu um unless one of them is bluffing which i don't think they are are willing to compromise on this from what i've seen <laughs> georgia it's fascinating to get your take on all those stories uh great pleasure to talk to you thanks very much for joining us this morning that's georgia gold thank you